South Africa is a vast and fascinating country. At the southernmost tip is Cape Town, a beautiful city that's become one of the top tourist destinations in the world. People come to enjoy the sunny weather, the clean beaches, the restaurants and the abundant wildlife. But there is another less visible side to Cape Town that's less affluent and glamorous. Many people still live in crowded conditions in areas called townships, inherited from the previous government that forced apartheid on South Africa. Apartheid separated people according to racial categories. Black people were denied basic human rights and forced to live as second-rate citizens in their own land. Eighteen years have passed since South Africa was liberated from apartheid. And while great strides have been made in rebuilding the country, many people still live in poverty, and daily life is a struggle for survival. And like in many big cities, we've become a throwaway society. Foods and products are packaged in plastic, Drinks come in cans and plastic bottles, and litter is often a problem. In the more affluent areas, there's a sophisticated refuse collection service. But in poorer areas, overcrowding is often a problem, as well as poor service delivery. An hour outside Cape Town is an area that's home to three very distinct communities. Masipumalele, Ocean View, and Scarborough. Although they are geographically close to each other, they are in fact worlds apart, socially, economically, and culturally. You know, it's always good to be around. Yeah. But three artists have crossed these divides. Emmanuel lives in Masipumalele, Monique lives in Scarborough, and Marius lives in Ocean View. In the normal course of life, these three people would probably not spend time together or get to know each other. But they and a number of others have crossed the physical and social boundaries to form a family and a movement that uses rubbish and litter as its raw materials. The very items we throw away they transform into beautiful objects that bring in a much needed income. So this one is made out of plastic and the inside is made out of a, a child's motorbike. You know those black kids' motorbikes? They always have the wheels falling off and you can find loads of them at the scrapyard. What's so special here is the relationship we have uh, with, with this rubbish dump. Um, our topic for today is, for the week, um, wiring. They're working with wire art. I'm showing them some art and skill how to make um, things out of wire work, but we concentrated on plastic, combining the substances and the material together. Emmanuel Kamengoma is 36 years old, and he's from Zimbabwe. He is the first person from his family to complete school and gain a further education. How are you doing? Five years ago, the political upheaval in Zimbabwe forced him to leave his country and his family, and he made his way to South Africa. Welcome to the Paradox Studios. This is the space, and this is the headquarters of the Paradox. <laughs> so the paradox virtually is like a talent house to achieve people who can use their own hands and their own skills to generate wealth. The life right now, I'm not sure. I'm barely surviving. Life is really difficult. I really. Um, so at one time divorced myself with everything else because I said, I've suffered enough, I've prayed enough, this life is not for me. I reconsidered my life and like I was born again. 
And then I said, I will be an artist because now I'm choosing out of love, consciously. I will do art, I will do music, and I will do teaching. Maybe I can make something out of this. What, what can we make, really? I'm not even sure. You got to recycle your mind with a new design. Yeah, something like this. I think, you see, with stuff like this, I think this is cool. <laughs> um, all we need now is a little bit of binding stuff and blah, blah, blah. Let's get going. This is something I think from a microwave. But it will do, like, I'm on TV, you know? I see you, like this thing. I can just take this thing and then build something out of it. What can I make out of it? Maybe I can uh, make this into a beautiful mask, really. Uh, check, for example, because I remove this, uh, this becomes almost like the mouth. The joy is in the creating, creating out of rubbish. And that joy, as if it's not enough on its own, sometimes people and then come, they pay for it. So it becomes a double blessing out of nonsense, really. It's really like creating something out of nothing. That is the paradox. <laughs> Basically, sometimes it's nice you know, to, when you're working in big structures to look at them because it's lots of materials you fit in as this on its own and you've got to remove it. Maybe it doesn't work, maybe you've got to use this. So you just have got to play around. But almost there, <laughs> as it is coming out. Um, the only thing now that needs to be done is reinforcement and painting. Yeah, this is the first minute creation made in the Paradox House. Well, when you are with the Paradox, you are well wired with the live wire of creativity. One thing that has happened specifically, like for me, is the transformation of who and what I have become, which is really what matters the most, uh, to find the gold inside you. So I'm just completing myself up purifying more, studying more, and trying to find myself more. Hey, I do want some money! I'm doing fine, it's been long since I saw This is Monique Fagan, a very successful artist who's been making sculptures from found objects for many years. Monique has two children and lives in the coastal suburb of Scarborough, not far from Masipumalele and Ocean View. Today she's fetching her son Oscar from school. In 2003, Monique was approached by the Komaki Environmental Action Group, known as KIAG, to train a group of women in using junk to create art. Okay, you fine there? Okay. Once I close the door, you stay in there. When I first moved to Scarborough 15 years ago, this was quite a remote um, community. There were very few people actually living here, and it's an hour away from Cape Town. And the people that lived here had, were people who wanted a quiet life. Um, but at the same time, I felt a sense of loneliness um, because it's a very affluent community, and I didn't really feel an affinity with the people that were living around me. And the work that I did with Kia gave me an opportunity to interface with people from Masimpumalele, which was great. It was like a lifeline for me, really, because I found people who were like-minded. So we would share our dreams in the mornings, and we compared our religions and our approaches to life, and we shared recipes and advice about our children. It was mainly women. And that kind of provided me with access to Masimpumalele, which it wouldn't have been a community that I would have gone into in the normal course of my day-to-day -day existence. 
and also gave people from Massey an opportunity to come to Scarborough because there was a personal connection with somebody. When Monique started working with Kiag, she met Yandiswa Mzwane, who was unemployed at the time and taking part in a beach cleaning project run by Kiag. The two women became firm friends and have a strong working and personal relationship. Today, Yandiswa not only passes on her skills to community groups, but she runs her own successful recycled art business called Elita Lonzo. This is Witsan's Beach, where Monique first went to find rubbish for her artworks. It is also where she met Jan Diswa and the beach cleaning team, the place where these collaborations began. Today, Monique and Oscar visit Witsan's Beach to see what treasures they might find. A plastic bag, a thing sound went up my nose. This whole place used to be a big, um, a dump floor. Around it, the water was full of junk. And the rocks were covered in junk. Up here, up there, there were no plants, just junk. The whole place was just junk and white sand. So originally when we started in the, in the project, I took a pile of stuff that I had found on this beach to like, introduce the concept to the group of women that we were working with, and they actually thought that I was completely mad. But I think that the real magic happened when we made the first, there you go, put it in the bag. We made the first bead, bead screen curtain, like we used the plastic lids that we found and we strung them together and we sold the first screen that we had made for 400 rand and a huge squabble broke out over a bag of plastic lids that had been collected from the beach. And, so, and the argument was, th those were my lids. I picked up those lids, those were my lids. And someone else had taken those lids to take home to make um, a bead screen curtain to sell. And people were very angry. And I said, this is amazing. This is exactly what we're trying to do. I said, we've actually transformed these lids into money because they were worthless before. Nobody wanted them. They were throwing them away and leaving them on the beach. You picked them up. And because you can make something out of them now, they've become a resource, they've become valuable. So that's a special kind of magic. I didn't really believe in it because I was even shy about it. Like, okay, we'll make this. It sounded as a good idea, but exchanging to people, to customers, uh, especially white people, if I can put it that way, that I will be this lady saying, okay, I'm selling this mirror, and then this is like yogurt, sunlight stuff. What, what do you mean? And uh, fortunately enough, people loved our products. They loved them so much. When I was walking on this beach and looking at stuff that had been thrown away since 30 years ago, like an accumulation of stuff from these communities around this beautiful, pristine area, that, and all this stuff that people had bought and thought was important in their lives, once that person has died or once a certain period of time has moved on, that, that stuff it becomes completely irrelevant. It is actually really of no use to us. And we've produced as a culture Ma, in the last... Ma, one piece. Fifth, good, good, pick that one up. In the last 50 years, we've probably produced enough stuff in the world to, last every, to provide for everyone hey, who lives on this planet. Out. Beautiful. And it just seems unnecessary to kind of keep remaking this stuff because, yeah. I mean, this is a perfectly good bottle. Monique shows us around her studio, and we see what amazing objects can be made from the things people throw away. This is the kind of stuff that I think finds a, like a midway point between the retail stuff and my own work, which is more about found objects that are not really reproducible. It's quite nice sometimes how you just change one thing and then it changes the whole sort of character of the... And this is, I don't know, we've been having a debate about what it is. My daughter thinks that it's a wild dog and I think it's a deer. Some people think it's a rabbit, but basically it's three plastic bottles that have been stapled together. There's a part of me that rebels against the idea that rubbish is something bad. 
and I suppose that what I'm doing by working with rubbish is I'm showing the potential that rubbish has, just in the same way that people who are not useful to society or considered to be worthless, this stuff is thrown away because it has no immediate short-term short benefit to the person who has bought it. And it's, it gives me a sense of satisfaction to reclaim those things. They still have value. But making beautiful objects is one thing, selling them is another. One shop in central Cape Town called African Image has been supporting the found object artists from the beginning. That's rather wild, 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 wild. Look at the back. My goodness. I like that. Oh. <laughs> it just my my Harry has provided input and customer feedback and always welcomes business from this group. I swear, I will, I will wear this at a party. So then you have to order one. <laughs> I find it very interesting in terms of the, the functionality of the, you know, like garbage stuff, where wear things that you don't even think that you can you reuse it. It's like a fresh idea all over again. So that's what makes people really, you know, excited about it. Emmanuel, Monique, Marius and Yandiswa are all connected to an organization that's at the heart of their community, the Mzanzi Community Building Project. They coordinate workshops and training and once a year host a public celebration in the form of the Mzanzi Carnival where everyone gets involved. So we work on, we work making day call for festivals and we work on the local carnival and the Cape Town carnival and the Gauteng carnival. Carnival actually creates a reason for people from different communities to come together and collaborate. So in a way it creates a gateway into communities that you might otherwise be unfamiliar with and that's quite a special thing. Um, I mean the people in the group say that they feel that they are ambassadors for a different way of living in South Africa. So I think people have discovered that actually being different from one another is interesting and not scary. I'm Marius Varis, Oceanville. I'm a recycle artist. In between Masipumalele and Scarborough is Ocean View. While it's a mixed and dynamic community, there are some deep social problems here, such as unemployment, poverty, and drug abuse. This is where I grew up. It's called the Seven Sisters in Ocean View. The flats names is all ladies' names. It's Sonia Court, where I grew up, Gail Place, Gloria Place, Francis Court, Maria Court, all the courts, Frida Court. That's all the courts you'll find in Ocean View, yeah. I'm gonna show you where my mother stays still here in, in Ocean View. This is where I grew up. <laughs> Yeah. Very proud of him. Very creative in things, but this is my image, but this is my mom. I don't hear him, hear much of him. I'm too busy. Papa Teresa. Papa Teresa. Papa Teresa. Papa Teresa. Give me five, guys. Give me five. 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 <laughs> okay, see you ladies. <laughs> Marius grew up in this often harsh environment and is deeply active in his community, determined to help educate and uplift people. Marius is a graduate of the Junk A New program, 
and now runs workshops as part of the Mzanzi community building projects with single mothers from Masipo Malele and a group of disabled people from Ocean View, teaching them how to work with found objects. We're going to Masipo Malele, the pink house. So basically we're gonna work there today. We're gonna be doing um, wire work. The, the topic of today is wire work, how they can, what they can do and make out of wire work. But each and every one got homework from me to do an animal, they must make an animal, a three-dimensional animal with um, body parts and eyes and ears and mouth and teeth. Today we're just mostly concentrating on the basics and the fundamental safety of, of the equipment and how the construction of small animals are being done. We put wings on your, on your, on your, on your chicken and we put some clothes on. We can make him like, we can decorate him. Guys, if you, be, you wanna be creative, you can decorate your, 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 your animals any way you want to. You can make the South African flag. Yeah, that's unusual. That's beautiful. That's beautiful and unusual. That was the first thing that I mentioned with them. Because you're coming from a disadvantaged area and a disabled center, doesn't mean that you are disabled. You can still mingle with everybody and be normal. Enjoy yourself and you're gonna see the open. And that's how the friendship grew. So, now you use a different packet again, maybe another color packet, put it together like this. Where's your bird? You see? And then afterwards, when you finish with it, this is now the wings. So what you're gonna do, you should put different colors like this, tie it down together with the plastic. You see there? And it's getting its shape already out of it. This is a, a, a community outreach centre. We're trying to develop this centre and make it into a youth centre where this learning, skills and development is going to be done here. But we're struggling with funding and getting place together. And from scratch and waste and material that we've got, we've made this place that it looks like this now. Sean is my, my partner. He's my, my, one of my junior coordinators. He also helps me. He's also a facilitator in arts and crafts. Marius used to work for a chain of supermarkets, but after much consideration resigned to go into the arts and community building on a full-time basis. And as you can see, this is junk material that we get from the dump or from our community. Broken toys and whatever we can get. And we're just combining the, the materials together like plastic and iron. And there's even some raw material as well here in as well. As you can see, this is a vuvuzela that is used the old way to sell fish. Eh? So what the people used to do, they would And if you hear that sound and you know that there's fish in ocean view. People's reaction towards our, our workers. Wow, is this really? What is this? Can you see my head? Huh? Can you see my head? Is the head moving? So I believe working together in a team, the more brains we've got, the better the product, the end result will come. So our vibration is planning to renovate this whole place into a youth center and a training center where youth of the community and the surrounding areas can come into to the arts and also use it as a 
towards destination route. I, I sometimes I get angry because I just see people sitting around in my community and I get frustrated because of unemployment rate that's going around in South Africa and it's growing and growing by the days. So I decided now nah, training these people, showing them what they can do out of waste or doing something. It's a way of keeping them away from the negativity because if I'm not going to do that, then the negativity is going to swallow them and they're going to go deeper into negative vibes or the wrong things. The indigenous Garden of Eden established on 24th of May 2011. And the coolest part of we as the youngsters and as me and so on, we passing the passing it on to the next generation, you see, so that they can also yeah. become aware and listen and do things in the, so that they can also contribute to saving our ecosystem and our, our planet as well. So with that, we can create masterpieces. That is the junk and the material that you get in the community. So we use that to create the wonderful work that you saw, that we just showed you today. When you love rubbish and you apply your energy into it, it simply transforms itself into something more special, much better and even divine. So it's not sometimes about you, it's about the others and about the team. In a way, it feels like a song that you start singing and then other people start singing the same song. You will have given a day to somebody because of your recycling. And I think it's quite interesting. I mean, it's like, a because I think it represents a mindset and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a growing mindset. Because at the same time as we started doing this here, it seems like a lot of people, not just in this country, but also in the rest of the world, started realizing that plastic was a resource. It's become more like a local movement where plastic itself is a resource that lots of artists have been tuned into and now there are many different people that are making a variety of different things out of recycled materials and we're hoping that this virus of using what we have will grow. Over the dunes. I'm on my good trail. Okay. So we can find our way back again. Hey? What is that? I don't know. You think it's all in one piece? I think so. 